Good evening, New York, and welcome to Brass Tax, produced by Frederick Brass. I'm Coley Clark from the Judicial Violence Symposium, and I'm your host for this evening. And you see me all excited and shaking my head and stuff? I am so happy that I have a game with me, Kevin Arnett. Kevin Arnett is the very powerful and famous young man who's done such <laughs> <laughs> great work in such a short lifespan. And Kevin, I hope he doesn't get shorter. No, but well, the, the work is fine. <laughs> and I've been out here in civil rights and human rights for a long time. Mm. And I know that the evil go after men and women like you, children like you, uh, when they are doing the work of exposing the ugly violence and evil that we have in our world. I am so excited this evening, Kevin, to talk about a second book on your road tour. <laughs> you are going to be touring the United States. Oh, uh, what are you looking at, nine weeks, ten weeks? Well, as long as it takes. <laughs> as long as it takes to get the word out. <laughs> well, you can't get it out in Canada anymore because Canada has, in fact, uh, placed Kevin on his watch list. And we need to be talking about that New York because Kevin does need our protection and our care. And we should make sure that the great men and women who have done the work of exposing the evils, whether it's the evil of Canada or the U.S. or whatever, uh, don't get uh, removed and unable to do that work in multiple kinds of ways. They move King with a bullet and others with bullets, but they move us and remove us in other ways as well, making it impossible to, to, to live, making it impossible to find housing, making it impossible to live a normal life. Kevin's on road tour and he's out here presenting his book to the world, Unrelenting, Between Sodom and Zion by Kevin on that. And for those of you who saw the last show, his major work, his major work Murder by Decree, Murder by Decree, The Crime of Genocide in Canada. And all of this is about Canada's up and up, hard, cold machinery to censor the truth in the stories that are being told by Kevin Arnett. But what I like about this story, Kevin, this is your story. This is the 20-year the saga well, longer than 20 years now, of me learning about the murder of children in the Indian residential schools, uh, talking about it and getting fired, not just fired from my church, but expelled from my livelihood, uh, losing my family over it, um, being blacklisted across the country and attacked in, in countless ways. Uh, not even because of me so much as what I was bringing out, what I, what I represented, which is Canada's guilty conscience that it committed mass murder and is still continuing those same crimes against Native people and, and many other groups. You know, Kevin, I was looking here at, 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 at your preference and going through and looking at your dedication, and I was remarked, I rem just uh, moved to tears when I read a little bit of this, and I want to read it to New York. But then this is Kevin writing. But the biggest impact you've had has been on my 10-year-old daughter. He's speaking to a Native woman, a Native woman who is talking to Kevin about his impact on her life and that of her family. She watched your film with me the other night, and she was in tears by the end. She said to me, now, now I guess my grandmother can have some peace wherever she is. This is a missing Native woman among the multiple missing Native women in Canada. She doesn't have to be alone anymore. This reverend has helped her to go to the light. Right, Mama? And the reverend she's referring to is to Kevin. And I told her, yes, that's true. And she smiled a big smile and said, I don't know that reverend, Mom, but I'm sure glad he is alive. In New York, you're famous for it. We're going to keep Kevin on that <laughs> alive. Unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. And Kevin is not alone because Kevin is going to go all the way back 
1761, <laughs> and that's the other Kevin. <laughs> well, that's a... That Where things <laughs> began. <laughs> um, yeah. My ancestors. Yeah, that is yes. an ancestor. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that well, ancestor? He's remarkable. One of, the th one of the reasons I wrote this book is people kept asking, well, what the uh, questions I continue to get from people is how did you have the stamina to do no, this? No, no, no. Before you go, let me, let me say this. I got to say this from 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 the other Peter Annette. Yeah. 1761, October the 17th, 1761. A great date. I believe that's Jesse Jackson's birthday. I can't remember. What up? We shall expose the hidden works of the darkness and drive falsity Falsity. to the bottomless pit. Right. Well, that was Peter Peter, Annette. Peter Annette, my ancestor. Speaking he, in the Free Enquirer. He was uh, challenging the dogma and the oppression of the Crown of England and the Church of England, and they locked him in the stocks for it, put him at hard labor when he was in the 70s. And um, c people kept asking me, what are the influences? Of, how do you keep going in all this work? And, and I realized that part of it is the my own lineage and the fact that we came from a long line of free thinkers and rebels and people who paid the price for doing these things. We were Baptists in England when it was a crime to be a Baptist. We had to come to Canada for that reason. Um, and it's, it's kind of ironic because my ancestor had been a British Army officer who fought at Waterloo and was given wa land in what was called Upper Canada. It's Ontario now. Waterloo. What is Waterloo? The Battle of Waterloo, 1815, where the British fought Napoleon. And uh, they, as he, a British officer, he was given all this land in Canada uh, from taken from Native people. And in a way, I often viewed it as perhaps part of the way that I compensated that in our own family for having done that, um, trying to get to the truth of what my people had done in the name of their God to, uh, to so mm. many other people, Native people. Well, that's unrelenting. Between Sodom and Zion. Now we're to this title, Between Sodom and Zion. Talk about this title, Kevin. I'm really excited by it. Well, it... Uh, when I started in this work, I didn't really understand what I was dealing with. You know, I thought that, well, if you tell enough of the truth, you get enough of the eyewitnesses to tell the, the, their stories, the people who are responsible will sit up and say, yeah, we're wrong, let's do justice. But, you know, I had to f get a few whacks in the head uh, to realize that what I uncovered was the norm of things, was the way that this society is. And I was blind to that for a long time. And I realized that I had been thrown out of a fallen city, if you like, Sodom. Um, there is a judgment, I believe, on my culture and my people for what we have instigated in the world for many centuries. And I don't mean simply white people, because any culture yeah. can fall prey to this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the native chiefs today in Canada are part of the problem as well, because they've been given benefits to cover up this story as well. Um, but it is the, the the culture that maybe my people epitomize that is devastating the planet and is, has so much blood on its hands that I don't think it's redeemable. I think there we have to leave the, f the fallen city, if you like, and head to Zion, the new city. We've got we to gotta reclaim the world. We've got to reclaim our own souls and our own minds. And I learned that the hard way by having a lot stripped away from me in life, my family, my children, my livelihood. But I'm glad for all that now because it opened my eyes, my heart. I was captive to four. I was a captive of the city in S of Sodom, if you like. You were captive in Sodom. I was you captive. You know, Kevin begins his career in Sodom. As really, you've got to read this story. It's, it is at this book is absolutely revealing of who Kevin is. I've been meeting with Kevin a few years now, but nothing brought me to know Kevin like unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. I like that, Zion. But Kevin, as a young, young man in Canada, a kid, so to speak, a brassy little <laughs> uppity brat. <laughs> yeah, that's what my dad calls like, him. <laughs> I knew so many of in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia oh. in the civil rights struggle. Uh, Kevin was, was young and very bright. He was not a child of great poverty. Uh, Kevin, in word, we would say, you know, well, we'd be asking him, boy, what's wrong with you? You got plenty. Just go over there somewhere and sit down and enjoy yourself. But not this child. This is an uppity brat. <laughs> and you have got to read about this brat. Uh, I was really struck, Kevin, about that first 16 years. Mm. As a young man in school in Canada. Yeah. And in home, in a family, growing up in a family. Can talk with us a bit about that, because to hear that, 
I think, is a revelation about why you will be driven to topple the most powerful, one of the most powerful figures on earth, a pope. That's a whole story in itself. Yes, yeah. I know. Bye-bye, <laughs> uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, <laughs> that was directly because of the work we did. But anyway, um, uh, you know, one of the incidents I talk about in there is when I was uh, 14, uh, we went up, and by we, I mean our United Church Sunday School group, mm -hmm. did an exchange with uh, a native community in northern British Columbia, of the Simshin people. And it was my first encounter with with Native people. I mean, as a Canadian, you see a lot of Native people on the street and everything, but you don't really know them. There's mm -hmm. this total apartheid divide, you know, uh, still very much today. And we went up to this village, which was very much untouched. And I remember ge I described, we get off the bus, and I had never seen children um, so wild and free. Like, mm -hmm. they had a lot of trouble. I remember a lot of them were sick, and uh, they were going around without shoes, proper clothing. One little girl had a mark on her head. They, her dad had hit her with an axe when he was drunk. No. I mean, you know, like, it was a totally different reality, like, if you like, third world reality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet these kids were um, just freer than anyone I had ever met. And mm -hmm. they didn't seem to have the apprehension and fear that my growing up in my culture you have as a child, right? We're always being told to do something rather than what you want to do, but do somebody else's notion of what's right, you know. So um, I mean, uh, these kids were uh, in the village. They were all running around totally uh, unconstrained. And then the, the clan mother shows up. This woman gets out of a car, and they're all quiet. <laughs> and they're all showing this total respect. And I realized later, my dad told me that was the chief. I thought that was my mama, but go well, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, like, despite all of the genocide and everything yeah. that they had lost, they retained that respect that I never saw, like, in my culture, right? Mm -hmm. So that told me something right there. And I remember that night just having my whole world had been totally blown apart just by that little taste that there was a different reality right in my own backyard I didn't know about. And still to this day, when I talk about these crimes that happened, Canadians can't believe it. And I said, That's because you don't know what's going on in your own backyard. But Kevin, you not you had a lot going on in your backyard, and your front yard too. Um, you're talking about the upheavals, and talking about the Maya. Talk a little bit about meeting the mm. Maya, and and how that came to be. Meeting Maya from Mexico, way yeah. up in Oak, well, Old Mexico. <laughs> yeah, what that old, old Mexico called Canada these days. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well that was when I was uh, training for the ministry. Uh, when I was 30, I decided to, uh, I didn't have a burning bush experience or anything like that. <laughs> a boy telling me to go to the church. You didn't burn any bush either. No. <laughs> 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 no, that was half my life ago. I'm 60 now. And, uh, but they, um, I went down on to Chiapas, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before the Zapatista rebellion, but it's the same area among mm -hmm. the Maya, the Mayan people. And these were Mayan refugees from Guatemala, mm -hmm. uh, from the military, the genocide there that, that happened. And uh, they were living in refugee camps along the border. And I went down there to, uh, I was part of kind of a f church fact-finding tour to, to, to see how we can help these people, right? Which mm -hmm. is ironic, because the very same church sponsoring us to do that had been killing off their own Indians in Canada, the That's United right. Church, That's right? right? So it's always easier to look uh, for their field mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what's going on. But anyway. I remember when I got there, uh, again, it was like going up to the village in northern BC when I was a teenager. Uh, there were kids running around every day, something like 30 to 40 children would die of malnutrition and typhus and things like that. And uh, the priest who was there, he was funny, he was an ex-Catholic priest who had been, like I would be one day, defrocked mm -hmm. for getting mm -hmm. too close mm -hmm. to the Indians, <laughs> right? And uh, That's why I wanted to read this name. Yeah, he's, <laughs> F Father Fidel, his name was, and uh, Fidel. Fidel, his name. So he took <laughs> the name because the, the bishop <laughs> tossed him out because he was getting too radical in his sermons, right? Yes. Uh, too, too much like Jesus, if you know. Right? So anyway, uh, but what's amazing? Two years after I met him, he was actually killed. A uh, landowner, mm. uh, uh, a death squad. Yep. Yes. Although they didn't kill him. I mean, there's no way you can kill that spirit, right? No. But. Um, Anyway, uh, are still going. he w he was showing me around the village, the the refugee camp, and these little kids were running around, and they had rickets. They they were barely able to walk, and yet with total innocence, total acceptance, and they took us into one of their little um, shacks, and gave us lunch, and besides the tortillas, on our plate were little piles of eggs, which were the only eggs in the camp. Huh? 
the only eggs they had, which should have gone to those children, were given to us. They're, they're guests. Yes. Because that's in the Mayan tradition, their ancient custom. The honor, yeah. And I didn't want to, but then I realized to honor these people, you got to do it not on my terms, but on theirs. Mm -hmm. And that was a real mm -hmm. lesson for me. And it was kind of funny because the priest was watching me the whole time because maybe he sensed that I was going to face that same kind of dilemma one day when I had to choose between do I do what the church tells me or what my conscience is telling me yes. about what, how we're treating Native people. Well, you know, Kevin, you had the my experience, but you had another experience. I am just amazed when I read Unrelented Between Sodom and Zion by Kevin Annette. Because uh, you could lead it up to this powerful story about what's happening in Canada with the genocide and your work to overthrow that genocide. Your work to expose to the world the highest church and the oldest church on earth, the Catholics. Mm -hmm. The oldest known church, y'all don't get confused now. Um, the Catholics. But Kevin, what do you got to do with Venezuela? Venezuela? Yeah. Um, you mean in the book? Yeah. I'm trying to remember that part. Yeah, it, I turned 60, you're testing they, my they memory come, They come to visit. <laughs> <laughs> they come to Canada. Which part are you referring to? Oh, uh, the very early part where you're meeting people in Canada when they're coming in as refugees. Oh, Guatemala. That's Guatemala? Yeah. Okay, all right. I was well, wondering, Venezuela, Guatemala. Well, anyway. that's the same people to me. They, um, yeah, you're right. Uh, but um, the when I was a teenager in high school, uh, the last year I was in high school, the coup, military coup in Chile mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's oh, it's Chile. In and Chile, it's but well, no, Chile. But it, yes. Chile and Guatemala, uh, yes. all the same, you know, genocide there, yes, political yes, genocide, yes. if you like. Um, after the, the coup in Chile was one of the uh, incidents that totally shocked my life and redirected me along mm -hmm. a really hard political path because after I met the refugees from the coup, I realized that I was part of a system that was willing to reach out thousands of miles and destroy another people just because they didn't like their left-wing politics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to be part of a society that would do that, so I wanted to change that society fundamentally. I guess it made me a revolutionary. We're talking about a kid. So yeah. that's, that's what so I'm I was looking at. You I were was just a kid. I was 17. And uh, so I began to get to know these Chilean refugees. I was part of a lot of the protests, you know, against mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. coup. I remember going into the U.S. Embassy. Uh, it was a consulate, the United States consulate in Vancouver, and uh, w lying down and having someone pour cattle blood on me to represent a corpse in Chile. Like, mm -hmm. we're doing that kind mm -hmm. of street theater right there. And mm -hmm. I... I remember my parents, well, my, mom, mom, my mother was shocked. My dad wasn't. He was very cool, like he still is. But um, mom thought it was going to ruin any chance I'd ever have for a job. And maybe it was true. I don't know. Who cares? But um, th those kind mom of... Mom cared. Mom <laughs> cared. The moms <laughs> care, right? Mamas care, right? But um, that I was being exposed to a lot of these people who had not just talked, but they had put everything on the line to try to change things for the poorest Mm -hmm. and for all of the people, not just the wealthy, right? And it made me a, a, a deep spiritual radical, not just kind of, um, you know, political radicalism can often be just here, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. felt it in my bones mm -hmm. that I couldn't be part of the system anymore. I had to, the only home, the way I put it there, is the only home I really had was a possible future society. That's how yeah. I saw it, right? And so struggling for that society became the focus of my life for the next 40 years. And you, and you met a brother who would help you with us, an older brother. Yeah, you a few hung out with a few of them, and um, yeah, and they were actually guides for you. Yeah, M mentors who helped you along the road. Oh, uh, some right, but I, when I was reading this, I was laughing because I was remembering the Ella Bakers, and uh -huh. I was remembering the C.T. Vivians, and I was remembering the Fred Shuttlesworths, and I was remembering the Medgar Evers, and all of these wonderful guides we had as young people yeah. in the Deep South, yeah, building the Civil Rights Movement, yeah. But Kevin wasn't quite like this. We were not up against the Pope himself. <laughs> a paper tiger, as <laughs> somebody once said. <laughs> that Pope is not a paper tiger. That church is not a paper well, tiger. Well, I know, yeah. But, I mean, the, the way they rule is mostly through deception. Yes. Um, but, I f I, you know, I found that um, ultimately it comes down, Kolya, to a personal choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Do we have the capacity in ourselves to actually say no, not just in words, but in every day how we live? What's going to be the focus every day of what we do? Mm -hmm. Nine to five existence? Or saying, 
what's happening to that person who we're about to crush, what's happening to that native child who's about to be trafficked. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens so widely now. It's one of the focuses of what I do now, a lot of the, the document of the child trafficking and, and how it got started in these Indian boarding schools. Mm -hmm. So. Well, Kevin, you not only documented the child trafficking, you took that case to the world. Mm -hmm. You had the audacity, the bold nerve and audacity to go to Europe. Can you talk with us about that? Well, that was in 2010 after we had forced the Canadian government to issue a, like a formal apology for the genocide in Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you can get that in my other book, Murder by Decree, which is both books are on at Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. um, but um, after the success of forcing the truth of genocide out into the open in Canada, groups in Europe heard about that, and I was first invited to Ireland, where my ancestors had come from. In fact, my great-grandfather left there on, a, on what was called a coffin ship, where the mm. British forced them off their land. His entire family died of typhus and starvation on the, on the boat over. And, uh, Not the entire, because they got you, Kevin. Well, that's right, but <laughs> great-grandfather survived. <laughs> Daniel O'Neill is the one. Yeah. And it was strange, going back to that land where the same genocide had happened, um, I was invited by a group of survivors of, uh, they call it abuse, but it was torture at a young age by Catholic priests. Uh, and, of course, it happened so much in the Catholic Church because there's a policy that actually says when children are raped, the police are not to be told, and uh, any priest who squeals gets excommunicated. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a standing policy. And in that kind of regime... Has that changed? Never. It's not changed. Even the present pope... Uh, but the present pope, that hasn't changed. ...supports it, uh, supports the policy of covering up in-house child rape. So that causes a lot of crimes, and th the victims of that crime invited me over. So I began to give some talks in 2010 in, in the spring in, in Ireland, and then from there, all over Europe, people were hearing about this, and I was getting to offers to come and not only give talks, but actually set up what became the International Tribunal in the Crimes of Church and State, and that's the, the group International that Tribunal into the Crimes of Church and State. ITCCS.org. Um, it eventually sponsored a common law court trial that found Pope Benedict and others guilty of genocide, including the Queen of England, Prime Minister of Canada, now um, let's go, let's back. So it found Pope Benedict and the Queen of England and others. Guilty of crimes against humanity under international law. Conducted in a, in a bona fide lawful court uh, that was convened in Brussels. Looking at the evidence uh, and uh, coming up with a guilty verdict. Now in the same two-week period in February 2013, when that verdict was announced, Pope Benedict resigns. And we know he resigned as a result of what we're doing because the Spanish government had issued them a note, issued the Vatican a note saying that if the Pope comes to Spain, he may be arrested because of the evidence in our, in our indictment mm -hmm. showing mm -hmm. that the Vatican is a child trafficking criminal body. So when he resigned, that was a signal to the whole world that even the mightiest ruler in the world can be brought down with simple truth and people willing to act on the law and not simply, you know, talk about it, but actually convict these people. Canada's most scented story and the man who brought it to light. Not just to light, but the man who, because of his work, was able to force one pope down and is still exposing the crimes uh, against uh, children and others by the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, uh, and the Crown of England. And the United Church of Canada, my former yeah. employer. Uh, and the United yeah. Church of Canada. I can't leave them out. Unrelenting. <laughs> Unrelenting. Between Sodom and Zion. Kevin is on a book tour. We, You've got to catch this man, because you've got to get this book. Go to Amazon.com. You can get this book. Uh, his other book, which is really the huge documentation of the crimes of genocide in Canada. Murder by decree. The sentence stories that Canada does not want us to hear. Doesn't want us to hear. When we go to talking about children in Canada and the people of Canada and the native people of Canada, be sure that you understand New York. You can just transfer it right across the border to the United States of America. Well, we continue these same crimes Today, as I speak to you, some native woman is screaming rape. Some child is missing. Some concentration camp 
that they didn't live on are invaded. I invite you, please, to tune in to Brass Tax with Frederick Brass, the Frederick Brass, Brass Show. Tune in. You will find men like Kevin on that, women like Kevin on that. You will find the great stories, the judicial violence stories. And I look forward to seeing you this summer at Princeton Theological Seminary to talk about judicial violence in the United States of America. We're bringing together a hundred of the finest African minds there are in the United States. That is, blacks who have been here through the enslavement, who are documenting these crimes, as Kevin has documented these crimes. Please, please, we owe it to ourselves, to our posterity. Murder by decree, the crime of genocide in Canada. Kevin, it's been my pleasure. Thank always you, Always my pleasure. It's always good to be to here. To have you come. Yeah and to be able yeah. to talk with you and yeah. to share, and tonight to also to, to, to not <laughs> come to you. <laughs> 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 I love Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela with Chile. <laughs> and the Linda and, and all of these other crimes that we yeah. are so guilty of, mm -hmm. Canada and the U.S. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Coley. <laughs>